Hi there, my name is Julia Friedlander. I am the C. Boyden Gray Senior Fellow and Deputy Director of the Geoid Economic Center here in Washington. And it is my pleasure today to welcome Fid Philip Hildebrand, the Vice Chairman of BlackRock, to discuss his candidacy to become the next Secretary General of the OECD. Now, Mr. Hildebrand, thank you so much for joining us today and for taking the time. I was wondering if I might be able to just start out our conversation by asking you why the OECD is so important for global economic governance and why it's you know the right time for new leadership. Sure. Well, thank you, first of all, Julia, for having me. And I guess in this virtual world, it's good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be able to do this shortly before we go into the final round uh, with the remaining candidates. Look, I think and many of you, I'm sure, uh, have seen this. All the other candidates, I suspect, have said the same thing. This is a critical time in the history of the world economy. In many ways, you can draw a parallel to the very beginning of the OECD. Um, in a sense, the precursor of the OECD was set up to give analytical support to accompany the rebuilding of Europe after the war. And luckily, today we're in a situation where we don't have destroyed infrastructure. But in many ways, of course, we are going to have to rebuild uh, important parts uh, of the economy. And it's at a time also when we're going to spend enormous amounts of money to do so. If you look at all the fiscal programs in the US and Europe, elsewhere, we're going to spend multiples of what was spent uh, in terms of discretionary fiscal policy uh, after the financial crisis. So how to invest this money, how to conduct the right domestic structural policies to accompany the, the public investment, these vast public investments, how to incentivize private capital to follow, uh, to build back better in a sense, to build uh, back a better economy, stronger, higher potential growth rates, fund the transition uh, to net zero, uh, address the inequalities that have become so apparent and such a big issue since the financial crisis. Those are the challenges. And I believe this puts the OECD squarely at the center of something very, very important and very consequential. And uh, it would be a great privilege and an honor to lead the institution during this time that will be so critical for getting us back uh, after the pandemic. Thank you so much for that um, and for highlighting the importance of prudent fiscal response. I think we, we certainly did uh, observe the comments by Laurel Spoon, the chief economist of the OECD, warning that this is not a time to close pocketbooks, but also to um, to use them effectively. Um, what, um, you know, you have an extensive background from serving as chair of the Swiss National Bank um, to working in private investment. Um, what do you think your, you know, personal background will bring to a multilateral economic institution where sausage making is often a complicated process? Well, first of all, I did spend 10 years in the public sector. Uh, I was very involved in the post-crisis regulatory reform very involved in the FSB, very involved with negotiations with treasuries, with regulators uh, in the G20 and, and beyond. So I feel that I've certainly been uh, been in the seats where you see how things happen. It was a passionate time for me. It was a time that gave me great satisfaction, even though it was a very difficult time uh, in terms of what we had to do both during the crisis, stabilizing the financial system, and then afterwards uh, trying to put in the right regulatory uh, reform set. At the same time, I've had both before and since extensive experience in the private sector in financial markets. And I feel very strongly that this experience, this combination of public and private sector experience uh, should be a great asset for the next leader of the, of the OECD. One of the great challenges we're going to face as a global economy is to mobilize enormous sums of private capital. No matter how you look at things, just take climate change as one example. Estimates, including estimates from the OECD, suggest that we're going to have to spend somewhere between three and six trillion dollars a year to fund the transition to net zero by 2050. These are huge sums of money. And no matter how expansive fiscal policy is or will continue to be in the years to come, there's no way that that sum can be generated alone through the public, um, the public sector. So part of the story here and part of the great challenge will be to implement the right policies uh, and the right incentives through public policy and public money that can mobilize private capital. 
So I believe firmly that particularly in the area of uh, transition to net zero, private sector experience, experience of capital markets, how they work, how you can activate uh, private money in pursuit of uh, an alignment with public policy objectives seems to me should be uh, an asset for the next leader of the OECD. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that you're just coming and speaking from Washington, where we're going to be starting um, starting a whole new a whole new world in 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 in, in a certain sense on climate finance um, and on dealing with climate change. Um, you know, I was going to ask you about that in my third question, but I'm going to go on to digital services tax, and I know this is a sticky one. We're working on a solution right now from the Treasury Department myself, so it's uh, close to my heart, but. Uh, if you were selected uh, this to start in in June, how you know how would you handle this? It's uh, a lot of moving pieces and parts. Controversial. Absolutely. Well, I, first of all, I put it out as one of the three imminent short-term policy objectives that have to be met, uh, if possible. And the OECD should do whatever it can do. In an ideal world, we would have an agreement by the time the next Secretary General uh, moves to Paris. Uh, it's hard to judge from the outside whether that's uh, likely or not. I think the reality is if we step back, we have to recognize that we're going to have a fundamental challenge of high debt levels and we need to get better and higher growth in order to fund these sovereign debt levels in the years to come. And our taxation systems need to be constructed in a way that is conducive uh, to better growth going forward. If we end up, which seems to be inevitable, if we fail to come up with a global framework, if we end up with national efforts and national implementation of national digital taxation regimes, uh, which again strikes me as inevitable politically in the event of failure to come up with a global framework, that will not be conducive to the best uh, growth environment we can possibly have. So therefore, in a sense, the conclusion to me is very straightforward. The world needs a global framework. And given the history of uh, the OECD in, in setting uh, effective global taxation framework, it struck me as, as obvious in a sense that the OECD should play a uh, essential role in trying to facilitate the coming together of the various participants and member states to come up uh, with a global framework. I am reasonably optimistic from what I see, uh, both in my current position as well as an observer of, of policy debates, that the momentum uh, holds some promise that we can move towards uh, a global framework on digital tax that um, aligns with you know, the efforts that the OECD has undertaken so far. Some of the early statement, uh, statements of the senior representatives of the new administration in Washington, I think, give, give rise to hope. But I also see it, frankly, from the perspective of the companies that are affected by this. Um, in many ways, it is in their interest, too, to find a solution that avoids uh, national initiatives at every level, uh, which will create a sort of a, a mosaic of digital taxation setups that will not be conducive uh, to efficiency, that will not be conducive to maximum growth. We're going to run into inevitable uh, systems that are not compatible, that are often in conflict with one another. So I think everybody has an incentive here to hold back, avoid uh, excessive national approaches, and uh, at least set out the basic rules of the road through a global framework. And uh, again, I have some hope and some optimism here that we are on track to do that, whether it happens before June or in the second half of the year uh, remains to be seen. I would be surprised if all the details on both pillars would be sorted out by the 1st of June. Thank you. Um, it's appropriate to take a pragmatic but also optimistic approach at this juncture. Um, Mr. Hidjabon, thank you so much for joining me today and wish you the best of luck in the final round of the selection process. Uh, someone was uh, alluding to it, um, I believe, in, in The Guardian the other day as akin to choosing the next pope. So um, we, we await the, we wait, we wait the white, white smoke. Um, thanks again and have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. All the best to you and hope to see you again soon.